My name is uh, Chris Benner. I'm the faculty director of the Institute for Social Transformation. And the Institute is really excited to host this celebration of uh, the students working in our Building Belonging program and the flash talks they're about to give. Um, students who've been involved in the 2020, 2021 year, this whole year have been invited to present their contributions um, to their research projects. Before we get underway, I did wanna acknowledge that the land um, on which UC Santa Cruz sits is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. Um, today, it's the Amamutsan tribal band, which is comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions, Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, uh, which is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and his heal from historical trauma. And I think it's really important as we have that land acknowledgement that it not just become routine, but becomes an opportunity to try and learn more and support the work um, of the Amamutsan tribal band and indigenous communities um, throughout the Americas. Uh, today, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Wanna make sure um, you all are mu muted um, until the students present, then of course you should unmute yourselves. Um, you know, we recommend that you change to speaker view up in the upper right hand corner. Um, you can select speaker view. Um, one new feature, I don't know if it's new, but I just discovered it today. Um, we will have a presentation of PowerPoints and then the speaker view, the person will be right next to it. There is a bar between the PowerPoint and the speaker. And it turns out you can slide that bar to make uh, either the PowerPoint larger or smaller to fit um, what you prefer. So that's really exciting. Uh, the chat function uh, is turned off at the moment during presentations, just to try and avoid a little uh, distraction for the presenters themselves. But the presentations will be clustered into three groups of four to five presentations each. And we hope to have time for question and answer uh, at that time. And, and we'll ask you if you do have a question, to click on the reaction button at the bottom where there's the option to raise your hand and then that'll pop up uh, in uh, my view and then I can and call on you um, for that. Uh, and then uh, we will be going in the order that's on the public site uh, of the event. So you have a sense of what's coming up. Uh, and today's event is being recorded. Uh, and with those housekeeping things out of the way, I wanna uh, introduce uh, our Dean of Social Sciences um, Catherine Mitchell, and it's her vision, she's been here now four years, but her vision um, that really created the Institute for Social Transformation as a body to help support this kind of work as well as other work around social transformation. Uh, and I uh, wanna introduce Catherine to introduce the Building Belonging Program. So over to you, Catherine. Hey, thanks so much, Chris. Wow, I can't believe it's been four years already. Time does fly, especially in the pandemic. Uh, but I, I'm really more than delighted to talk about this program. It's one that's super close to my heart. Um, the Building Belonging Initiative is, is a five-year program that's designed to increase engagement and build a, a greater sense of belonging for underrepresented students. Um, and it does that through uh, connecting students with faculty research, with the service learning projects and research that the faculty have uh, ongoing. Initially, uh, we thought we would um, develop, help to develop and, uh, and expand engagement with faculty, and that would give undergraduate students a sense of real connection and acceptance at the university. And the, one of the key uh, highlights of this program is that the, the fellowship awards are $1,500 uh, for students who, who work approximately 100 hours or so. And when you make opportunities like this paid rather than volunteer, it opens up uh, for these students uh, the, the opportunity to engage in this kind of way meaningfully with, with faculty, uh, uh, even students who have quite limited financial means. So they don't have to work outside the university in order to support themselves. They can, they can work meaningfully with faculty instead. So I, I um, really would like to have a big thank you to Alec and Claudia Webster, who through the Helen and Will Webster Foundation generously uh, underwrit this program. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. And it's for a full five years. So this is really exciting. I mean, the five-year window gives us the opportunity not just to offer these kinds of opportunities for such a long time span, but also to assess 
the, the success of this kind of a, a initiative um, in a meaningful um, time span. So it uh, gives us a chance to really see what works and what doesn't in this kind of a program. I also wanted to thank uh, Chris Benner for his incredible leadership of the Institute for Social Transformation, as well as Mikel DeSupolo and Evan Knight for administering all programs, but this program in particular uh, under the auspices of the Institute for Social Transformation in the Division of the Social Sciences. So this was our first uh, full year. We had a pilot program before this year, but this is our first full year. And we gave out over 100 fellowships, um, totaling $150,000, all of which went directly to students. Uh, we have more info on this you can access on the Institute website, or maybe somebody can put that into a URL in the chat uh, at some point in time for anyone who's interested in, in learning more about those statistics. 28 faculty members from all eight social science departments and several programs uh, work closely with these students uh, who are able to help the faculty directly with their research. So this is a real win-win. And faculty, I know, are delighted to have the students, these brilliant students, helping them on their uh, research. So uh, what uh, the event is for this afternoon is to um, provide some of these fellows an opportunity to share their research experiences with others. And today we're going to hear from 23 students who've taken on research projects ranging from uh, climate change to social media, immigrant justice, COVID, um, incredible kinds of opportunities for them to engage with this, these socially and politically relevant questions of the day. But before we get to this incredible re uh, work, I, I want to introduce Catherine Quinteros who's been doing some um, wonderful work of her own uh, by helping us to evaluate this program. Just as I said, you know, one of the wonderful things about having a five-year program is you can evaluate it uh, for, those, for that time period and see, see what's working. And if something isn't, then tweak it uh, right at the beginning so that it'll be better for the, for the next few years. So Kat um, Quinteros is a second year doctoral student. Uh, she's in uh, the social psychology field of psychology and works alongside her advisor, Dr. Rebecca Covarrubias. They together are researching issues of identity, culture, health, and education. And um, Dr. Covarrubias' research examines, and so does um, Katz, examines the experiences, challenges, and strengths of minoritized groups, both students and faculty um, in higher education. So um, in the role as program evaluator for building belonging, uh, Kat is engaging with um, the, the, the program and the, the faculty and students to, to identify what, what are the key levers of change that may influence university belonging, feelings of belonging, feelings of, of um, uh, acceptance. And, that, and therefore, that through those results, um, find ways to improve retention uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and feelings of uh, welcome at the university for underrepresented and minoritized students. So just to give you a little bit of information about Catch and her successes, she received the Chancellor's Graduate Internship Campus Fellow Award for this kind of research on building belonging. And she's also the winner of the Graduate Research Symposium this year with the Best of the Social Sciences Division Award. So Kat, many, many congratulations and thanks to you for this incredible work. I'm gonna hand it over to you to tell us about some of your findings. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, Dean Mitchell. So let me go ahead and share my screen because I have a PowerPoint. One quick second to set up. Can everyone see that okay before I start? Yes, awesome. All right, let me just move everyone around a little bit. Uh, there we go. All right, so as you heard, um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about the work we've been doing with building with the Building Belonging Program. This talk in particular is called Building Belonging Through Researcher Petition practitioner collaboration. But before jumping into the project, I want to give some context on why this work is important. So first, UCSC is one of only 17 HSI research institutions in the nation. And there's a student population of about 58% students of color. Another important fact is that in 2020, the UC system increases admission of underrepresented groups by 16%. These are great strides towards equity and inclusivity, Yet, racial minoritized students, specifically Black, Latinx, and Native American students, are less likely to graduate than their white peers, especially if they're first generation to college. So 
So the question is, how can we improve retention rates for our students through offering support they find is actually needed, which leads to the Building Belonging Program, whose goal is to increase engagement and build a greater sense of belonging for underrepresented students through research experiences and mentorship, what you've all been doing these past quarters. The project builds on the past work, which has shown that university belonging is especially critical for minoritized students of color, and that research opportunities help prepare minoritized students for future careers and cultivate an interest in graduate programs. And finally, the importance of faculty mentorship, which has been shown to have various benefits for students, such as in acquiring new skills, development of critical social networks, and the ability for students to see themselves thriving in academic spaces. So to evaluate the best practices for increasing belonging, recruitment, and retention of minoritized students, we, the researchers, work with the building belonging staff at every step of the way. First, in developing a theory of action to set specific goals and activities to support those goals, then throughout instrument creation to now where we begin analyzing data. This collaboration allowed for both groups to inform each other. The practitioners brought with them their expertise and knowledge surrounding the logistics of the program, and the researchers were able to bring in their theoretical and analytical knowledge, as well as possibly acquire future publications. So for data collection, our timeline was as follows. In fall 2020, we created the surveys for both students and faculty. We administered the post survey for uh, the fall cohort, and we also gave a faculty survey. In winter, we did both again, the pre and the post survey for the winter cohort, again, sent out a faculty survey for the faculty mentors, and also began data analysis. And in spring 2021, you guessed it, we're also doing a pre and post survey again for the spring cohort, again, a faculty survey. We're still doing data analysis, but also we're moving into the next stage, the phase, which is conducting interviews. So you all probably remember the many surveys we sent you. Thank you so much for your participation. When we coded the open responses for the surveys, we saw that many of you reported an increase in belonging, research identity, confidence, and skills. Students also described the highlights of the program, such as how their view of research changed throughout their time with their mentors. For example, one student mentioned how their time doing youth participatory action, or YPAR research, helped them learn the importance and value of participant experiences in research. And others mentioned how, infor how forming new relationships with graduate students and faculty members not only helps them feel more comfortable with research, but also feel comfortable enough to reach out to them on advice about graduate school and applying to jobs after graduating. And many of you mentioned how great it felt feeling that you were a part of something, a community that met weekly to talk about new things that you learned. This was especially important at the year after the year we've had throughout the pandemic. Many of you talked about how having faculty to help navigate this year was extremely helpful. Finally, I wanna leave you with this quote, which is a great example of the general feelings we saw in students. This one has been explained that oftentimes marginalized communities can feel unappreciated or incapable of being part of the research community. The Building Belonging Fellowship helped me realize my ability as a researcher and feel confident that I belong in the research field as much as anybody else. I was able to receive valuable research skills, networking skills, and necessary support during this experience. So this student emphasizes how the combination of building belonging factors help to show her that she does belong in research and that she matters, which is the same for all of you. All of your voices and experiences matter, and I really can't wait to hear more about your projects later on. So moving forward, you all gave us some great recommendations for improving building belonging practices. For example, both students and faculty want more time in the program to develop important connection and skills. Finally, because this project involves both researchers and practitioners working closely together, now the staff at Building Belonging have the tools to continue evaluating the success of the program and refine the program to reflect their goals of building belonging in minoritized students at UC Santa Cruz. But without all of you students, faculty, this would not have been possible. So thank you for your time and support on this project. My final thank yous first to my amazing uh, advisor, Dr. Rebecca Govarubia, the incredible staff at Building Belonging, the CFA committee, and all of you. And before I leave you all, to all graduating seniors, congrats, you did it, you're done. So proud of you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. That was just awesome. And uh, I just wanted to express my own appreciation for the ability to work with you this year. Um, your insights into this program um, are just incredible and will really help strengthen this program going forward. And it's really been just a pleasure to, to work with you. And so without further ado, we're going to jump right in and we'll be following the uh, schedule as it's listed on the website, which I just put in the chat. And so first up is um, Jonathan Sanchez from the sociology department. 
a project called We Belong, Collaboration for Community Engaged Research and Immigrant Justice Project with faculty mentor, Steve McKay. So Jonathan, over to you. Cool, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, and yeah, so through my time with the We Belong Project, I got to work on the We Belong Collaboration for Community Engaged Research and Immigrant Justice Project. Through this project, I got to work closely with graduate students and Dr. Steve McKay of the Sociology Department. Um, but yeah, through this project, we hope to kind of foster and understand feelings of belonging of undocumented slash mixed status families in Watsonville and Santa Cruz County. And okay, so to collect data, we conducted interviews of undocumented family members, both parents and children. Once we interviewed them, we transcribed these interviews and then translated them if they were done in Spanish, all in hopes of preparing them for open ended coding. Um, first of all, yeah, this project meant a lot to me because I come from a mixed status family from Los Angeles. So kind of this project gave me the opportunity to kind of give back to like the community that I feel has done so much for me. Um, but yeah, I learned so much through this project, and I'm really grateful to have been a part of this project. Um, but through this project, I further understood the resilience of undocumented, the undocumented community, not only in Santa Cruz, in, but in the US as a community that is thriving. A consistent theme throughout the findings was that feelings of belonging often related to having a sense of thriving. If they felt like they belonged, they also felt like they were thriving. Despite consistent feelings of discrimination, xenophobia, and setbacks, undocumented family members were able to find a sense of belonging through having the constant support of their Watsonville community and in seeing their children or themselves succeed in school. Despite what they face on a day-to-day -day basis, undocumented family members were able to find resilience in their communities and families, generating a sense of belonging and thriving. I learned so much from this project and I'm grateful to be a part of such important work. Overall, one thing I hope I, like I hope to take away and I hope we all take away from this is that undocumented communities are a resilient and thriving community. Most importantly, they're superheroes that hold us together. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to all of you who came together and to make this all possible. I am honored to be a part of this project. Wonderful, thank you, Jonathan. And the next project are a couple of students who are working with um, James Dusay Battle in the sociology department. So please welcome Tamar Sesson and Andrea Asher. So our project is a pandemic in the ring of fire, COVID-19, diabetes, and climate change. And our project objective is to connect the effects of COVID-19, diabetes, and climate change to one another. So the context of this project is that it allows us to understand the complex relationships between COVID-19, diabetes, and climate change um, to develop preventative solutions. Um, as our uh, contribution to this project, uh, both Andrea and I evaluated sources and wrote annotated bibliographies. Um, our first takeaway from the project is that COVID-19 is a endemic rather than a pandemic. The term syndemic was coined by Merrill Singer in 1994 and is defined by the interplay of multiple pandemics and risk factors. Academics argue that COVID-19 is a syndemic because it interacts with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and it is intensified by socioeconomic disparities. Our second takeaway is that systemic racism is prevalent in all three categories. So for example, Black and Indigenous people of color typically have a high vulnerability to wildfire compared to their white counterparts that live in the same areas. Um, areas that are predominantly Black and Latinx, such as neighborhoods in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Detroit, typically have more COVID cases due to unsuitable and unsanitary living conditions. And similarly, the same areas that have a lot of COVID cases also had high rates of non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes. Our third takeaway is that government response to public health crises has yet to improve since the introduction of the term syndemic by Merrill Singer. Merrill Singer introduced the term syndemic to describe the interplay between substance abuse, violence, and AIDS, also known as SAVA. Singer argued the factors, that factors such as financial instability, self-identity crisis, abusive partners, lack of support and education contributed to the syndemic. Singer critiqued the public health response to address SAVA syndemic, contending that long-term syndemic changes must be done to address it. Today, communities of color have disproportionately have been affected by the COVID-19 syndemic in the same ways. 
So what we've been concluding throughout our research is that COVID-19 has exacerbated socioeconomic inequalities, increased the vulnerability of those with pre-existing conditions, and exposed health disparities already prevalent in society. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Our next group has been working with faculty member in the psychology department, Jeremy Yamashiro, and it's Hananiel Siraji. Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Hananiel Siraji, and I'd like to talk to you about the project that we've been working on, Collective Convergence onto Misinformation, Social Network Factors. So the important question that we were looking at for this project was how do contagions fit in social networks and under what circumstances do members in the network converge onto misinformation, as well as what kind of dynamics are demonstrated. So our project looked into how complex and additive contagion played a role in the spread of misinformation and a complex contagion is essentially a contagion that requires multiple sources before the recipient sees any change in behavior, while an additive exposure is a simple contagion where exposure is the only requirement needed. Our project had participants look at pictures of various rooms and remember items that they saw in each picture. Afterwards, they were subjected to complex and additive contagions where the complex contagion in this, in this project were videos of people reciting items with some misinformation and coming from two different sources, while the additive exposure was simply showing the items once again, but only coming from one source. And so what I've done to help contribute for this project is I've helped build the Qualtrics surveys that this was taken on, as well as helping clean up the data entries through <clears throat> through OpenRefine. And so where we are right now is we've just finished data collection, so we don't have any results as analysis is not done yet. And overall, this experience has been a positive one for me, and I'm grateful to incorporate what I've learned from classes to a real world setting, as well as explore my interests and interactions. And lastly, I'd like to thank Dr. Yamashiro for giving me the opportunity to work with him on this project. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll remind people if you have questions, um, keep them in mind and in a couple more presentations, we'll have a little space for that so you can raise your hand. Um, the next project, a couple of students were working with a professor in the economics department, Galena Hale. They also had a chance to work with a PhD student and I'll just lift that up because a number of different um, projects had that opportunity and uh, we're getting some of the feedback from the evaluation that that can also be an important part of building um, connections. So uh, here I'll invite uh, Yang or Elena Lee and Demetrius Rodriguez to share their work. And I believe in this case, we actually have a video recording of the work that they've been doing. Thank you for coming to the Building Belonging Fellowship Flash Talk. Uh, thank you, Evan Knight and the Institute for Social Transformation for funding this project. I had a lot of fun doing it. My name is Demetrius Rodriguez, an environmental studies, economics, and philosophy student at UCSC, and I'll be introducing socioeconomic differences in barriers to healthy food choices. Our team found literature that identified a few barriers to food choices around the world with an emphasis in the United States. Ted Liu, an economics PhD student at UCSC and I, worked to combine synthesis and interpretation of literature to lead PI Galena Hale and our team to ask questions about intersectionality, socioeconomic status, and education's effect on people's food choices. So the population we focused on for this first round of synchronous remote interviews was UCSC undergraduate students. And we had an amazing team of undergraduate researchers who were volunteers for the most part, conducting our set of interviews during this past winter quarter. And they include Marlene Nava, Maria Elena Benavides, Alessio Vega, Madison Bankosh, and my counterpart in the Building Belonging Fellowship, Elena Lee, and of course myself. So in our work, we found three distinctive categories of barriers to inquire about for their effect on UCSC students' food choices. And they include socialization and cultural factors, access and cost, and preferences and misconceptions of healthy diet. So respondents answered a bunch of questions and some of which included summarizations of their diet, their idea of what healthy is, um, socioeconomic circumstance, what things might make eating, eating healthy easier to them, and my personal favorite, how might or if a $100 stipend change their daily food choices. 
And next, Elena is going to summarize our findings. Thank you. Thank you for Dimitri's introduction. I'm Elena, and I'm going to summarize one of the results in this research. As Dimitri said that his favorite is the question how, about how might a hundred dollars stipend can change their daily food choices. As we can see from the chart, many people would like to add vegetables, fruits, and meats to their food if given a given us a hundred dollars stipend per month. And with my own interview experience, some people also want to exchange more fresh food with frozen food. We will analyze our data from multiple perspectives and draw conclusions. For instance, here, I considered both race and gender and will show more different perspectives in our paper, since all the interviews of our group were conducted through Zoom video. We avoid some biases to the greatest extent. So our conclusion will be relatively accurate. Once the paper comes out, I hope you guys can have a chance to read it. Read it. Thank you so much. All right. Great, thank you. Uh, and then the next project, uh, the Hi, student everyone. was working with Mark Masood in the politics department, and we'll now hear from Anushka Shaw. Hi, everyone. So for my project, I work with Professor Mark Fatima Masood on a project called Vulnerability and Positionality in Fieldwork of Law. The main goal of my contribution to this paper Professor Masood is writing was to help answer some of the questions around in what ways do revelation of identity, such as researchers discussing their race, gender, sexuality, and research influence how scholars study the law empirically and what we as readers take away from it in regards to law particularly. My work involved researching existing scholarly papers that are written about this topic, but also reading about researchers' accounts of their fieldwork and noticing the differences in which their accounts based on whether they had discussed their identities within their studies. In this way, I got to read about researchers from a diverse variety of backgrounds, meaning different races, ethnicities, nationalities, gender, sexualities, and researchers with disabilities, which is very cool. And I concluded my work by synthesizing the research I had done in a very short paper with the main theories of insider-outsider perspective, feedback loops surrounding vulnerabilities of researchers, and the feminist standpoint theory of all women. Some of the main takeaways from our research was that knowledge is socially constructed and socially situa situated. And so we found that when researchers actually discussed their, the factors of their identity and were willing to be vulnerable in their study, they were able to provide key insight into the ways their identity might have influenced their methodology and the other parts of their study, such as interactions with interviews and interactions and interviews with participants. We also found that researchers, particularly those who did not fill the typical fit the typical white cis male researchers bill, faced the threat of trauma, mental exhaustion, and even guilt from their research experience um, by effect, experience being affected by their identity, which is where the idea of a feedback loop comes, a uh, feedback loop of vulnerability comes into play. I want to thank Professor Masood for trusting me to help him with this project. And I also want to sh show my appreciation for this pro program for providing me with this opportunity to put my foot into the research door and learn about more about the research and writing process. Coming from a non-academic background, I thought getting into research was an extremely intimidating task and there was no better way for me to win this kind of experience through any other program. So thank you and thank you all for being here and listening to my presentation. That was great. Thank you. Um, and we have time to take a little bit of a pause now, three or four or five minutes maybe, to ask any questions of the students who have presented so far. So um, love to hear any questions. And if you click on the reaction um, button at the bottom, you can raise your hand and you'll pop up and I, I'll see and I can call on you. Could be questions about the research itself or the experience of working with faculty members or, or anything.
I'm seeing lots of thumbs up, but I'm not seeing any hands. So maybe we'll jump into the next set of presentations. Uh, so the next one is a couple of students who were working with two um, faculty members, Flora Liu and Emily Murai from the Environmental Studies Department. So please welcome uh, Kimmy Dare and Janja Gettinger. Hi everyone, um, I am Kimmy Dare, a fourth year environmental studies major and education minor. And I'm John Jagenger, a second year environmental studies and psychology major. Our project is entitled Building Environmental Belonging, Racial Inclusion and Diversity Among Undergraduates at UCSC, and it is overseen by Drs. Flora Liu and Emily Murai of the EMBS department. And so for background, I decided to undertake this project because I struggled to establish a community in the EMBS department in my early undergraduate years. In addition, there was a racial incident that left me feeling very frustrated and voiceless. And so these events triggered me to push for departmental change and promote racial inclusivity in the EMBS department and the institution more generally. This research used a mixed methods approach through 12 semi-structured interviews of ENVS current and former undergraduates of color, key informant interviews in the education, psychology, and ENVS departments, and multiple surveys from the institution. In these student alumni interviews, we found many reoccurring themes, such as isolation amongst their peers, misrepresentation in the curricula, lack of representation amongst staff and faculty, and frustration with harmful racial dynamics in classroom settings. Interviewees also shared recommendations on promoting anti-racism and building environmental belonging. This includes hiring more faculty of color, building a stronger interdepartmental community, and adding more scholars of color in syllabi. This research is significant because it created a platform for 12 undergraduates of color, many of whom were grateful and relieved to share their experiences to catalyze a departmental change. They voiced a desire for a permanent place of commiseration, thus leading to our final recommendation to create an EMBS BIPOC peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program, which we discussed further in our findings. With this research, we hope that we are able to break the vicious cycle of BIPOC invisibility and misrepresentation, and instead turn it into a virtuous cycle in which BIPOC students feel heard and their concerns are addressed for a more inclusive ENBS department. And you can read more about our research in these interrelated projects. For one, I wrote a senior thesis, which recently won the Dean's and Chancellor's Awards. Uh, and I was the lead author on a correlated policy memo, which is being circulated throughout the department. I used both the student interviews and Kimmy's senior thesis as the foundation to many of the policy recommendations that can be seen in the memo. If you're interested in reading more about our findings, please feel free to contact any of the team members for copies. Thank you so much. That was great, thanks. Um, and uh, we'll have another chance to ask questions and, and I realize I shouldn't necessarily assume that everyone knows how to navigate um, to raise their hand. So we'll make sure um, in the next break, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask the question and, and uh, jump right in. But for now, we'll do a couple more presentations that are all on similar themes. And so the next one um, had a chance to also work with Dr. Rebecca Covarubias in the psychology department. Uh, Kimberly Hatch, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I had the privilege of working with Professor Covarrubias, and welcome to our project. Um, profiling first-generation faculty on making sense of racial and ethnic identity in first-generation visibility campaigns nationwide. The inspiration behind our research originated from the First Gen Initiative, an initiative created to raise awareness and visibility of first-gen students on college campuses using a powerful method of connection, first-generation faculty narratives. Though we have found evidence of similar campaigns nationwide, Little is known about what exactly gets highlighted in first-generation faculty stories. Our goals are to find how race and identity come through these narratives. Our project addresses two questions. How salient is racial and ethnic identity in public website profiles of the first-gen faculty? As well, when highlighting the first-gen identity through each narrative, how salient is the discussion of race and ethnicity? Does this vary across institutions depending on the number of students of color they serve? The significance of this project in three main points, connections, experiences, and identities. Inquiries about how initiatives, specifically those serving large numbers of first-gen students, grapple with race and ethnicity are ever more important to further understand in how they use the correlations and connections between experiences, 
identities and sense of belonging amongst our first gen student populations. Edification of this project is as follows. Racial resonance, cultural cornerstone, societal success. We continue to see a trend of race explained as an embedded influence on outlook in terms of personal and academic success. Our culture uh, being stated as a guiding light and foundation to build on. In societal su success, the first generation identity has been the motivation for many to work towards upward mobility. My contributions to this project have been data set collection, systematic account configuration and research composition associate. I've collected over 400 narratives from first gen faculty nationwide. I've transformed collected data into a set of meaningful and cohesive categories, analyzed qualitative data into quantitative data to provide a systematic account for quantitative data testing. And I've collaborated on definitions used for coding each data set. Lastly, I would like to say thank you to my incredible mentor into the Building Belonging Program. This fellowship has given me a first gen Latinx German Mennonite student, not just the opportunity, but the privilege to be a part of something bigger. This research is an homage to my immigrant parents, sacrifices and values that were bestowed onto me of perseverance and hard work. It is an honor to represent Latinx biracial students and show we too belong in these academic spaces. We too belong at the table. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, the next project are three students who are working with Hannah Hausman in the psychology department. Um, it's Kaylee Kurland, Huda Ajaz, and Garrett Swelgen. And uh, we have Kaylee Kurland with us today. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be presenting on behalf of everybody in my group. I am very excited that I am working with Dr. Hannah Hausman in her cognitive psychology laboratory on research about um, how feedback can influence student learning. This um, year, we've been working on a series of research projects, and we have completed our very first research project, and we're very excited to show the results. Um, this research investigated the effect of using elaborative feedback versus a concrete and um, direct um, feedback on um, on the way that students um, will experience their learning. Um, so the way that we um, had this um, set up was that students would read a passage and then they would get a series of questions to see how they understood that passage. And based on those questions and their answers, they were assigned to random, they were assigned randomly to different conditions. So these conditions were either the direct answer of the, um, of the question or it would be an elaboration. So for example, if the question was, people assume more words start with K because there are many more words. Oh, there are, people sort, assume more words start with the letter K, but there are many more words that have it as the third letter. So those students in the correct answer group would get the answer availability heuristic. And those group of students in the elaborative feedback condition would get the this answer words that start with K more easily come to mind than the words that have K as the third letter. This is the reason that people overestimate the amount of words that start with the letter K. Based on our research, we realized that the elaborative feedback really helped students learn. They were able to um, transfer their learning to new examples and new concepts in a second test that we gave them, and they were able to um, retain this information for longer. So. I really appreciate working on this project. It was one of the very first research projects that I've done as a transfer student at UCSD. And I am very, very grateful for Dr. Hannah Hoffman for um, allowing me in her lab and working on this project. I'm excited to see what we do in the future. And I am excited that we are gonna be able to publish some of our work. Thank you so much for having me in the Building Belonging Program. All right, thank you. Uh, next project is a student working with uh, the faculty mentor, Laura Bartlett in the education department. The project is Suddenly Distant Teachers Work in the Context of COVID-19. Please welcome Lila Hart. Hi everyone, my name is Lila Hart and I am presenting my project that I worked on, which is Suddenly Distant Teachers Work in the Context of COVID-19. The goal of the study was after interviewing and surveying 75 teachers across nine different 
different focal states to understand what are teachers going through right now with in the spring of 2020 being in person and then being shifted into remote learning. The context and importance of this is that COVID-19 totally changed the way teachers had to plan their daily schedules. They tackled on long work days, worried about student inequity, and also feared about juggling their health when do I either choose to go in person and risk my health and the people I love's health, or do I try to support the students as best as I can? I contributed to the program in transcribing over 30 interviews through a software known as Sonics and making sure they were as smooth and easy to code and qualitatively and analyze for my team. My main takeaways that I gained from this project is the invaluable nature of mentorship. I have amazing team of mentors who not only take care of me, but allow me to take care of them and help take on some extra work. Um, it was an invaluable experience and made me realize not only do I love teaching and that I want to continue down this path as my career, but I really love our project website as well as our project findings. If you type into Google Suddenly Distant, you'll see it right away. And I want to thank the Building Belonging Program. Wonderful, thank you. And the next project also is working with a faculty member in the education department, Cynthia Lewis. Uh, this is Educational Justice Across Digital Divides. Please welcome Jessica Garcia Garcia. My name is Jessica Garcia Garcia. In this academic year, I had the opportunity of working alongside Dr. Lewis in the research project, Educational Justice Across Digital Divides, Building and Sustaining a Community Partnership During COVID-19. Through the research, we were able to observe the disparities pertaining to already disadvantaged students, such as newcomers and English learner students. The project focused on the transition of the Corre La Voz program from in-person to fully online due to the pandemic. My role as an undergrad researcher included gathering qualitative data by taking field notes of each session and translating the notes for the lead researcher. As an active participant observer, I had the opportunity of mentoring students throughout the year and encouraging them to feel comfortable enough to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves to engage with the program. I also helped develop the survey to have the opportunity to hear more feedback from the student mentees on how we could help improve the program in the future. This was a unique and impactful experience because as a transfer student, I looked forward to take part in research at UCSC. As the pandemic began, I feared graduating without this unique experience. I am very grateful to everyone who made this opportunity possible and especially to Dr. Luis, Dr. Lopez, Mario Gomez Zamora, and all my Senderos mentees for mentoring and teaching me through this journey. Thank you. That was great. And I, I wanna give us a chance to take another pause now that the next set of projects are more focused on research on uh, environmental issues, animal research and ecosystems. So, um, want to open up for anyone who might have questions for any of the students who have presented so far. If you raise your hand, I can call on you, or otherwise, if um, you just want to unmute and jump right in, that would be fine also. I see uh, Becca Covarrubias. Do you want to go ahead? Um, Lisa has been so great. I feel like I'm learning a lot from this. I, I was particularly struck, um, Kimmy and Kyla, by your projects, given that, I mean, our context is UC Santa Cruz, and there's so much um, application of, of the work that you're doing. And I'm curious if you've had a chance to engage audiences with some of the findings um, and if there's been some reception to learning more about either, you know, climate within, um, you know, particular majors or even, you know, teaching and instruction for, for your two different projects. I'm just curious about that process of, of sharing out your findings with people. You'll have to go ahead and unmute yourself and answer. 
Hi, sorry, was that for me? Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. oh there's two of you presenting actually. That's right, yeah. That'd okay, because I heard like the second name, okay. Um, uh, there's just like a lot of um, interesting things that we found in the research, as we said, and um, we're still actually hoping to release the policy report today. Um, and there's just like a lot of information that the key informants provided, um, including like scholars of color and like, yeah. And yeah, what was the question? I'm just curious about whether folks like, you know, if there's if, like uh, plans to actually share the findings out and have recommendations for folks. And if there's been reception, like are folks really open to, to learning about it and hoping to adapt some of your findings? Uh, yes, sorry, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, no, it's good. There was like a lot of interested interviewees reading it. Um, a lot of key informants also interested in reading it across departments. I think that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, hopefully it does lead to some change and I'm excited for people to read it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Chris, Chris, I have a question. Or yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. This is Claudia Webster, and um, I had a couple comments that go back to the syndemic one, which I couldn't figure out how to make a comment on. But I would hope that that information is transmitted to alumna Lori Garrett, who is a, a consultant on MSNBC, because I think that she would be very interested in presenting that kind of information to the public. And um, she's a pandemic expert. Yes, Lori Garrett. Yeah, and um, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, for Lila Hart's group. Um, and I thought we have a daughter who's a third grade teacher, and she has absolutely been wrestling with exactly these things that you are um, studying. So I think you'd like to know that this really has a lot of meaning, real world meaning to teachers who very often work independently. And, um, and, and my, our daughter is worried about uh, all the questions that you discussed. So hooray for that. So also, also we thought it was perfect that on the digital yes. divide that the Lila Hart's bandwidth is low. There's a thing on our <laughs> screen that keeps saying that, which just points out the digital divide. One last thing, we'd love to see the policy memo on inclusiveness in environmental studies. So that's it. Great, great comments. Thank you. I, I don't know if any of the students mentioned there, Andrea or Tamar or Lila, or do you want to um, say anything or respond to those comments? We can put you in touch with Lori Garrett um, as a possibility for sure. Just thank you, and we've heard that from a lot of other teachers too. That they they really appreciate just hearing other teachers saying the exact same thing. Um, so thanks. Great, thank you. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, the next team was uh, working with Vicki Oles in the anthropology department uh, on chimpanzee video coding, uh, Lauren Hobbs and Peyton Syme. Hi, uh, we're the chimpanzee video coding team. My name is Peyton Syme and I've been part of this team for three years now. And my name is Lauren Hobbs and I've been working on the team for a year and a half now. And we work with Vicki in the Primate Ecology and Molecular Anthropo Anthropology, or PIMA lab, over in the Anthropology department. Yeah, so what we do is we look at camera trap footage of different animals in the Issa Valley in Tanzania. Some of the common animals we see are things like pangolins, red-tailed monkeys, baboons, leopards, clip springers, hyenas, dikers, and even checkered elephant shoes. So yeah, we record data about these animals, like their species, demographics and different behaviors that we see. Um, our emphasis with these videos is on the Eastern chimpanzees there and their specific behaviors. 
And as a team, we actually learn how to identify them and these behaviors. So for example, in the picture here, you can see on the left, it's an adult male named Samaki. On the right is adult female named Kobujicho and her son uh, Bingwa in the front there. Um, in our coding, we, re we record many behaviors, but we have a specific interest on the termite behaviors there, the termite fishing behavior, sorry. Yeah, and I'm really grateful to have now received support from the Building Belongings Program for two quarters now, and working more specifically with graduate student Seth Phillips, who I use behavioral software to code chimpanzee investigative behaviors at the termite farm. And I am so grateful to have received such generous support from the Building Belongings Program, program for uh, three quarters now to act as a peer advisor for the team and to work on my senior thesis, which is looking into the temporal and spatial distribution of the chimpanzee's prey species here at ESA. Um, it's been super fun to work with the chimpanzee video coding team. Being a part of this team for such a long time has really fostered a sense of community for all of us, particularly during the times of the pandemic. And it's not only allowed us to learn, but also to participate in research with our peers, which was a priceless experience. So thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, the next project is actually four students who had the opportunity to work with uh, their faculty mentor, Melissa Caldwell, in the anthropology department. Uh, Sam Bass, Dee Capelli, Isabella Crespin, and Alyssa Cabral. And we have with us here today, uh, I believe, Sam and Dee. So Sam Bass and Dee Capelli, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for the intro. My, my name is Sam Bass. Um, for my part, I focused on several research questions. Um, where do different species fit into human hierarchies of caring? Um, when are animals viewed as disposable versus a food source, livestock, a pest, or a member of the family? What work has already been done exploring animal welfare issues through an ethnographic lens? How can multi-species ethnography challenge the hierarchies through which other species are viewed? Can ethnographic work promote animal welfare while still practicing cultural relativism? Uh, to answer these questions, I reviewed and summarized existing research on attitudes towards animals across cultures, including the relationship between neoliberal government and stray dogs in Mexico, growing animal rights activism in Mexican border towns, long-term ethnographic work uh, focusing on the emotional experience of workers in an animal shelter, and the relationship of animal welfare movements to animals as food culture in Korea. I also interviewed a founder of a fish rescue organization in New Hampshire, uh, documenting the unique ways that fish are viewed in an animal welfare context. I definitely wanna thank Professor Caldwell for the chance to get a window into the ethnographic research process, which had been an interest of mine for a really long time and to shape its direction in this early stage. Okay, Sam, I'll take it over from here. I'm Dee Capelli and uh, my research involves the prison system and dogs. One of the most successful prison inmate rehabilitation programs in the US involves selected inmates who learn to train selected dogs from local shelters. The program's success criteria includes long-term positive behavioral and emotional responses, as well as significantly lower recidivism rates from the program's human participants. My research asks, what about the canine participants? What metrics are used to measure the program's success for them? After training, are the dog placements tracked? What conclusions can be made about the lifelong well being of the dog as a direct result of this program? Who and what measures a dog's life as successful versus what makes the program successful? Now, as an older, first generation, legally blind student with a service dog, I am deeply grateful for the support of this program and Professor Caldwell's guidance. This is an opportunity to belong through research and to conduct this exploration into the interconnectedness of animal-human relationships. It fulfills my dream to enrich and transform how humans regard animals without whom we humans could not exist on our beautiful planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dee and Sam. Uh, the next project, uh, the students had a chance to work with uh, their faculty mentor, Stacy Philpot, in the Environmental Studies Department. The project is Ecosystem Services and Shade Management in Coffee Agroecosystems. 
Uh, please welcome Jenny Sue and Robin Fowler. Hello. Uh, our project was on coffee plantations. Um, we conducted a meta analysis, which is where we go through um, a bunch of papers and extract data from those papers. Um, in doing this, we could compare the data from a whole range of different papers and then take that data and see similarities and difference within, within the studies. Um, this is a continuation of Dr. Stacey Philpott's work. Um, in 2014, she started it um, and searched uh, a database for words like coffee, shade, management, pest, and biological controls. She wanted to see um, uh, how management systems on coffee plantations affected the pest uh, predator and damage. So um, like in coffee farms, there's either a traditional style of growing coffee, which is grown in a jungle-like system. So there's like a lot of trees and coffee underneath. Um, recently, though, it's been transformed um, into more of a monoculture where it's just rows and rows of um, the same type of coffee and no shade whatsoever. Um, so there's been a big like transformation in coffee plantations, and we wanted to see how the um, agro ecosystem reacted to that. Um, so we looked at how many pests were in the very heavily shaded plantations and how many pests were in the monoculture plantations and also like how many predators there were and if those predators, uh, increase in predators would facilitate like um, a decrease in prey because the predators would eat the prey and therefore save the coffee um, from being damaged. Jenny? So right here you see on our database, which is slightly highlighted in yellow, and this is all of our data that we extracted, and we compared them based on what each individual paper says, based on the number of shade available. Like, for example, one of them will have two systems, one of them would be heavily shaded, and one of them would be not shaded at all, and that would be in categories one and two. We actually categorize them based on numbers from one to five, five being the most shade, one being the least shade. And some papers might not have categories up to five, which is okay. So from there, we calculated the log response ratio, which is just a really fancy way of saying how one system differs from the other in terms of shade levels based on whatever we're looking at. So in the graph here, we're looking at pest prey abundance. So that is how we're looking at how many prey species are in a specific ecosystem with a certain amount of shade. So from the pest prey abundance graph, we found that the negative numbers represent low shade and the positive numbers represent high shade. So CBB is coffee berry borers, and that would bore right into the coffee fruit and completely destroy the year's crops. So we found that coffee berry borers had a significant increase when there's less shade and scale insects had a slight increase with, when it's less shade whereas all the other insects, leaf hoppers, leaf miners, other insects and stem borers would have no significant impact with shade. And I just wanna thank the Building Belongings Program for giving us this opportunity to work in ecology research with Dr. Phil Pod, and thank you all for coming. Great, thank you so much. And our uh, last project for the day, and uh, other projects of students couldn't be available to present, but the last one for today, um, students had a chance to work with uh, Kai Zhu, professor in the Environmental Studies Department, also a chance to work with uh, a graduate student, Yi Luan Song, um, who I believe is here today also. Uh, and the three students are, are Luke Hamilton, Caitlin Schilt, and Jade Gooseman. And I'll just say, as part of admitting my own ignorance, uh, the topic phenology observers on social media I didn't know what phenology was, so I just want to make sure everyone knows. It's the study of cyclic and seasonal 
phenomena, natural phenomena, especially as it relates to climate and planet and animal life. So um, with that introduction, please welcome Luke, Caitlin, and Jade. All right, so the goal for our project was to collect tweets based on specific keywords that were related to phenology so that we could use those to sort of, you know, create a database in order to train a natural language processing AI to make that collection process easier for phenology researchers and so that they could use, instead of having to do their own collection, you know, data collected from other people that are just posting on social media. And so my role in this was to filter through, you know, large 40,000 tweets and, you know, pick out the ones that were and were not related to phonology uh, in order to help train the AI. And so throughout this project, I learned a lot um, about not only what, you know, a lot of people do and don't know about phonology, because as Chris said, not a lot of people know what phonology is. Um, it's not a very discussed about topic, but also has a lot um, to tell us about how the climate can be changing. And I myself learned a lot about, you know, how training an AI actually works and, you know, what goes into that, as well as, um, you know, how it can really help to work in a team. And I'm really thankful to have gotten the chance to work with, you know, these amazing other students and Yuzuan and Kaiju as well. Yes, thank you, Luke. So we, this was a large project. As Luke was saying, we went over 40,000 tweets. It was insane. And coming in, I didn't really know what phenology exactly was. And going through all of these tweets, it was a difficult process. But so to start off with this process, we decided to have protocols. So we developed clear protocols to define what phenology, what tweets were phenology related versus what tweets were not phenology related. So this was a twofold process, the first part being labeling. So we defined the factors based on a couple different perspectives. So first, we looked at the tweet and we defined, okay, was there an organism or environmental condition related in this tweet and let's say the environmental condition was wetness let's say the environmental condition was humidity heat different things and another can another factor was what happened and is was there an action that was happening in this tweet or what didn't happen in this tweet and also we had to develop at what time was the tweet taking place? Was this a present tweet? Let's say there's a lot of citizen scientists out there. So let's say a citizen scientist is taking an image and of a flower or a diff a, an organism, a, a different species. And is this a present? Is this photo taken at this time or was this photo taken months prior? So we developed uh, recognition as to whether these tweets were phenology related over a longer period of time or versus over a shorter period of time, even kind of factoring in, okay, did they use keywords spring, summer, autumn, fall? Was there budding involved? Was, was there blooming, blossoming involved? And also taking into account the times that we were looking at these tweets that say cherry blossoms were in season in this in this time period and it, taking that into account as well and making sure that the tweets weren't poems, weren't poetic, weren't metaphors, so those wouldn't be phenology related. And if the, if the photo was taken at an uncertain time period, then we wouldn't, we would be safe and not mention that as phenology related. So these are the different factors that we had to take into account and the next step of our process is natural language processing, which I am not acquainted with and not familiar with, but Jade is amazing in that field and they also were able to work with us. We all come from various different backgrounds, uh, departments even, so this was a cool process to integrate all of our different knowledges into this one piece. And also working with Yulon and Professor Kaizu, this has been an amazing journey and uh, I hope that we in these next steps in the next phase in the summer we get to uh, expand on our observations from social media and use these citizen scientists to 
our advantage and work alongside them. So I would also like to thank everyone and on building belonging. This has been amazing. Thank you, Chris. Great. And um, Joni, I think I could uh, stop sharing the screen now so we can begin to see each other a little bit. We have, we have a few minutes for uh, any more questions of these last set of presenters or even the earlier ones. We're going to ask in a minute um, Rebecca Covarrubias to reflect a little bit on the experience of being a mentor in this program and the evaluation overall. But um, if anyone has any questions you'd like at the moment, um, now's an opportunity for that. Um, hi. Uh, do you just ask questions out loud? Yeah, please go ahead. I'm actually Jade Guzman. Um, the link wasn't working. I, I worked on the last project that was just presented uh, and I can talk about it a little bit if anybody's interested for the natural language processing. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, we um, didn't get a, we cut you off at the end. Sorry, go ahead. No, it is no problem. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody can see my screen, um, but uh, my name is Jade Guzman. I worked with um, the phenology team, and I think that Kate and Luke put it beautifully. I think that uh, one thing that uh, one thing that was my favorite during this project was definitely talking to people about it who had no idea. Like you said, you began by saying um, nobody really knows what phenology is, um, and so talking to people about what that was and having them say like, oh, I plant in my own garden and there are seasonal plants. And, and what we've come to realize is that there is a role that everybody has in the climate crisis. And that's definitely something that I've gotten to learn. Um, just like Kate said, everybody was from different departments and we were all kind of all over the place. But that was one of my favorite things about this um, project and being able to do this research. And I hope that we can continue to do it in the summer. Um, on the topic of the natural um, processing learning, uh, like Kate said, that was kind of, I came in at the tail end of this project um, and I work with uh, Yulon and um, Professor Kaizu uh, heavily on this field. Um, I had a lot of background in IT because uh, I did robotics in high school, but this was definitely a learning curve for me, um, to say the least. Um, it was very difficult. When they say the devil's in the details for programming, they really mean it. Um, you, We spent, I can't even begin to explain, uh, just hours on end fixing one or two little minor things. Um, and it almost felt like you were pulling your hair out. But at the end of the day, it really is interesting to see something you created, learn from all of the hand combed data. Um, and I think that we all kind of maybe learned patience throughout this project because it was a lot of um, combing through everything, making sure that everything was um, just as it needed to be um, from start to finish. Uh, usually sometimes in projects uh, that I've worked on before, you kind of do like the beginning stuff and it can be a little bit messy, but this was something that everybody needed to be hands-on for. And I feel really grateful to have the team that I did. Uh, Luke, Kate, Professor Kaizu and Yulin did amazing. And I was so, so lucky to be able to be part of this group. Um, and again, if anybody has any uh, questions or anything like that, I feel very lucky to be here and to be able to talk about the natural processing learning. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dee, I saw you had a hand up. I did, thank you. I just had a question about this, uh, this particular project in the sense that how did you go about finding 40,000 tweets? How, what was that process? I mean, I can see this application being used across a lot of different fields. It's, it's really exciting. Um, but I just wondered how you did that. Luke or Caitlin, do you wanna so, take um, that one? Yeah, uh, so the actual like collection of the tweets, that was um, mainly done by Ilwan, but basically mm -hmm. it was really somewhat simple. And the way it worked was um, all we needed were specific keywords that we chose. And so some of the keywords we chose were like blossom or flowering or budding, you know, things that indicate, you know, a certain life event mm -hmm. primarily for, for plants. And, um, base, it's, and so there are actually already uh, programs that you can use and just okay. put in those keywords and it will just comb through thousands, like hundreds of thousands of tweets and pick out all of the ones that had keywords in them. And so we were given um, met, like spreadsheets uh, on Excel with hundreds of thousands of tweets on them. And so each line in the Excel doc would be that individual tweet. It would give it the date and the time. And our task was basically going through each of these tweets pretty much one by one um, and like reading through it and figuring out if that one was 
phonology related or not. And after a while, um, it definitely got easier because you kind of realize like which keywords had a lot more uh, phonology related, whereas other ones like one of the ones uh, like Bud had very few actually re related tweets because, you know, a lot of people would use Bud like, oh, hey, Bud, things like that. So we began to filter through a lot faster and a lot easier doing that. And how did you just define it through tweets as opposed to picking up uh, the same kind of uh, language or words in, say, blogs? How did you narrow it to tweets? Uh, I think- Is that, is that the I, software again? Um, yeah, so it was it was oh. Yiluan's decision to do the tweets. And I think it was primarily just because um, it just had the largest database. It is it is one of the most used uh, social media platforms there is, yeah. and yeah. so we kind of figured that that would just give us the best opportunity to get a get the like the widest variety of of tweet of information. Well, thank you so much. That was really informative. I appreciate it. Uh, maybe time for one more question. If there's anyone else. You can just unmute yourself if you have a question and jump in. So I have a question for um, the uh, chimpanzee research. So I'm wondering what um, what behaviors were really um, unusual that you found uh, related to the termite fishing. Ladies, do you want to go or shall I say something? No, Peyton and Lauren. I feel like you're more qualified. To <laughs> <say anything. laughs> well, we'd love to hear either Peyton or Lauren first, and then um, Vicki, we can hear any follow-up from you, but love to hear the students' perspectives on that question. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I can talk a little bit about my work with Seth. So, yeah, some of the interesting behaviors that we're looking at is just how they know when the termites like are really there in abundance. and if they see seasonal patterns and how they use their senses to kind of tell. So yeah, I use like coding things to look at when they like visually inspect and like they'll sometimes like dig up the mound and then smell their finger or smell the mound and then determining whether they're successful that time to see kind of like how they're gauging when to fish a few places. Peyton, anything else you wanna add? Uh, the termite fishing is Lauren's specialty, so I think that was an excellent answer. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll turn it um, to uh, Rebecca Covarubias. We've asked her to reflect a little bit on the experience of being a, a mentor, um, as well as the overall evaluation. But as part of introduction, I wanted to highlight, so. Dr. Kovarubis is a professor in the psychology department. You've heard a little bit about her research as a social and cultural psychologist, really looking at that intersection of identity, culture, educational equity, and institutional change. Um, but she also has a, an experience as a student and learner in building belonging. She um, was born and raised in a low-income neighborhood in Phoenix, Arizona, as the first in her family to attend college also. And, and at the University of Arizona, she had an opportunity to participate in the Ronald E. McNair Achievement Program, which is a federally funded uh, research, rigorous research program that prepares low-income first-generation students of color for graduate study, in part by helping to build relationships um, between students and, and faculty. Um, and so that experience inspired her to pursue a career as faculty where she now works with students and other critical partners to translate the research findings into actionable practices. And it's just been a joy um, working with Becca over the last year along with Kat in helping us think about this program and, and evaluating it. Um, so just with such deep pleasure, I'm turning it over to you Becca to share a bit of your reflections and experience on, on this work. Hi everyone. I'm so glad just to have this space to just celebrate your work and you. And I, it does start to feel a little meta when I think about how, um, you know, my own research experience and now being a mentor in this research program and then studying the importance of research. So I love all the interconnectedness of that and the continuity of, of these themes here. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on the collective work um, of this group and I just feel really inspired and, and hopeful and so moved and like I want to get to work because I feel like I need to catch up all with what you're all doing. Um, you know, the, the program asked me to share a couple of words about what it meant to be a mentor and evaluator for the program and I had three immediate thoughts that I wanted to share with this group. Um, I just want to make sure I can see everyone. There we go. Okay. Um, it's good to see your faces. Um, so my first thought was that um, I was reflecting on the mission of the Building Belonging Program, right? So it's the commitment to offer an opportunity um, to connect students and faculty in these sort of meaningful research and service serving um, experiences and projects. And so I'm working with my graduate student, Catherine Quinteros, who you heard um, earlier speak about um, the research parts of that. Um, and we're learning more about the program and how it can better serve its mission. And so you know, what we're learning is that while well, any program can always grow, and I think I love the openness and sort of that growing, it's really clear from our observations that this program matters on campus for a number of reasons. And so um, I think it matters that there is an opportunity for talented scholars in this group and, and other UC Santa Cruz students who have a potential to be part of this program um, to really explore important questions about our world and our society. Um, to establish new and stronger connections with um, community of scholars, and that includes your mentors, whether they're faculty or graduate students, um, that really share those interests um, with you and those passions. And I think the other part is to continue to redefine perspectives and knowledge in the fields of research that you're in um, and, the, and the sort of projects that you're studying here. And sort of without that opportunity, without that space that we have on campus, I think we would sorely, sorely lack a rich diversity of work and perspectives and talent and ways of making meaning about the world around us. And I think that would be a really big disservice to um, just our knowledge about our lived experience um, in this world. Um, and so what we learned from our surveys um, and some of the surveys that um, this program is helping to develop a stronger sense of connection to community and whether that's a connection to your mentors or others in your research space or a deeper connection to your interests or the fields that you want to pursue and study um, I think those connections really matter for um, signifying, right, it's, it's critical because it affirms that you are right where you belong. This is where you should be. Um, and it's so important that we're learning from some of those experiences, right? I feel fuller because I've learned much from you. Um, so then this brought me to my second thought, and that was to reflect on my own first research experience as an undergraduate student. And as Chris mentioned, you know, I am from a low income first generation background and my first exposure to research was actually the Ronald E. McNair Achievement Program, which is a federally funded program that serves low income first gen students and or students of color. And the hope is to diversify um, graduate pathways and graduate study. Um, and you engage in this sort of uh, summer, rigorous summer research experience. They pair you with a faculty mentor. It's very similar to the program here, um, and it's incredibly meaningful. So I was paired with a faculty member who also was low income first generation indigenous woman um, in social psychology. And I was able actually to learn about research in a community school setting and learn how we could foster belonging among students in that setting. So, you know, I've been studying belonging for a really long time. So it brings me a lot of honor to, to think about this program and how it relates to my own experiences. Um, I learned two things from that program that I that I hope that you also maybe carry with you. Um, one, that it was so meaningful to connect um, with people who not only shared some experience and passions with me, but also who believed that I could accomplish anything. And that was really meaningful as I had a lot of doubt about my sense of fit as an undergraduate student. Um, my uh, mentors allowed me for the first time ever, right, to envision myself as a researcher, as a scientist, as someone who could pursue a career that I actually really didn't imagine. If he had asked me then, I would have never have said I was going to be a faculty member. Um, so that felt very important in terms of creating new, new visions for what was even possible. Um, they also helped me, though, to recognize that I, and I hope you feel this way too, as I'm listening to all the ways that you've contributed to your projects, um, that my lived experience gave me tools that other researchers around me didn't have. Um, and it took me a while to understand what that meant. And um, mostly because, again, I doubted a lot about my sense of fit in that place. But then I recognized actually I'm working on these projects that, no, actually, I felt I brought a lot of wealth to that, that, that design. Jane, I'm just thinking about how you had uh, training in robotics and how probably critically essential that was to the, to the project. Um, and so I learned that I had the ability, for example, to ask important questions about my community, about the social justices, sort of injustices around me. Um, I had the ability to tell a compelling story through research because I learned the art of storytelling from my dad. He's an incredible storyteller. Um, and I learned that I can translate that into research and writing and presentations and teaching. Um, and that was something that I carried with me and learned. 
And then I had her ability actually to create strong narratives about um, communities and families like mine, because I knew that strength firsthand. Um, and that I could use research as a way to communicate that to people who had maybe less exposure or had different ideas or narratives about maybe the community that I came from. Um, and so none of this would have been possible without mentors like I had and without access to a research experience. And I attribute a lot of where I am as a faculty from that earlier experience. In fact, without the McNair program, without research experiences like this, I would have never been faculty member. Um, so it's really important, I think, for not only diversifying pathways, but again, for envisioning new ways of being. Um, I hope that some of that is true for you today, that I hope that you can imagine new or strengthen um, you know, existing possibilities for your futures and that also you recognize the immense wealth and skills that you're bringing into that setting, um, especially as you engage in these really important topics. Um, and so that led me to my final reflection, and um, which, you know, which is how important I think the program is for faculty like me, um, especially as I think about all the ways that these things are connecting. And so um, I know that the mission is focused on the belonging of student scholars, but maybe something you didn't realize actually is that um, in being able to work with students like you and collaborate with you, you actually helped me feel a sense of belonging to the academy and to a place like UC Santa Cruz. And I don't want to undermine that because I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think in being able to sort of build new ideas with you, you're really affirming that I am where I'm actually supposed to be too. Um, and that I value very greatly. Um, I wanna share that there's a lot of responsibility and opportunity that comes with being a faculty member, especially someone who's you know, a Latina faculty member from a low income first generation background. And I love, I love the work that I do. And yet it's also really challenging sometimes. And sometimes I do question whether I belong in this space, not because I don't think that I'm uh, that I deserve this or I'm not good enough, right? But that I recognize that sometimes there's structures in place and, and sort of climates in place that um, make you question whether your ways of being or thinking are valuable or the ways that you're contributing are valuable. And I recognize this is very structural in nature, right? Um, and so yet when I think about what nourishes me and what sustains me as faculty in this role, I think about students like you, I think about Kimberly and being able to work with you and Kat and being able to collaborate with you on these projects um, and I feel really inspired that I that I get to learn from you, to laugh with you, to build new um, ideas about the world, to redefine our respective fields, and to work toward changing systems so we never question our sense of fit in a place that we're obviously meant to be in, right? And I think that's really the vision for a program like this: is that the more that we diversify the work that we're doing, the scholars that we that we train, and the and the collaborations that we have, that that question of belonging. Um, maybe it actually makes the program cease to exist in some ways because um, it's just sort of, uh, we recognize that this is where we are supposed to be. Um, so the Building Pro Belonging Program for me is a place where um, I get to be a learner, um, a supporter, an advocate, and a researcher in community um, with talented students. And so for me, um, this relationship is a two-way dynamic because I grow so much from these connections um, and things that I take care, uh, that, that I take with me and that really anchor me in this university. Um, and so that's why this matters to me and why programs like this, I think, are important on our campus. So I just want to say congratulations to you all on your research. And um, I just want to thank you for your important work and the work that you'll continue to do and for telling all of your research stories today. I just feel really honored to be in this space and to be a mentor in the program. And I can't wait to continue to grow and collaborate with um, future students like you in this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becca. And I'll turn it back now to our Dean, Catherine Mitchell, to close us out. Oh, well, thanks, Chris. Um, this was just such an amazing experience and ended with a, such an amazing, heartfelt presentation from uh, Becca. Uh, really appreciate it, um, all, everything you said. And I appreciate all the faculty mentors for this incredible program. I, I know uh, our students are amazing. I already knew that. I know the faculty are amazing. And now they're, they're together. And this amazing collaboration makes me just really, really happy. And um, I also want to thank our amazing donors. So I'm, I'm going to blow a kiss to Alec and Claudia, which you don't usually see to your donors. But they're uh, just wonderful people. And, and their spirit lives on in this program uh, and in many other ways on the campus. So stay tuned for the building belonging applications of 2021-22. Um, they're going to go out late summer, early fall. I want to once again thank the amazing Institute for Social Transformation with the amazing Chris Benner, Mikel DeSuplo, and Evan Knight, and all the other people who work there. Um, and um, I hope to see everyone in person next time. So thanks to everybody for coming. And I hope you all have a really, really wonderful evening.
So take care. Bye.